And joining me now is entre the entrepreneur and owner of the Dallas Mavericks and owner of a lot of other things, Mark Cuban. Mr. Cuban, welcome to Meet the Press. Thanks, Chuck. Glad to be here. Uh, look, last summer you called Donald Trump a great thing for politics. Has this candidacy been good for the country? Um, in some respects, yeah. On a longer term basis, absolutely. I think he's opened the door to non-traditional um, candidates, which is a great thing. I think he's taken out the traditional you know, um, bullet points and political speak. That's a good thing. But those are longer term issues. In the short term, there's a lot of divisiveness and a lot of uncertainty, and that's not necessarily a good thing. It's pretty, uh, my interpretation of your comments on that was, you know, a couple years ago when somebody asked you about running for president, I think your answer wasn't just no, it was hell no. Um, but I take it that what Trump has done has made you feel comfortable about someday thinking about public service. Is that fair to say? Well, it's certainly more of a consideration than it was for the reasons you, we've mentioned before, that you don't have to be the perfect um, Stepford candidate like you would have been in the past. Look, there's clearly a desire here for another alternative. We've got a new poll out this uh, a Sunday morning with a majority of voters in both sides feeling uh, negative feelings toward both of the potential nominees. Why not run third party? You know, the Libertarian Party still hasn't held their nominating convention. It wouldn't take much for you to get that nomination if you went down there and your political views seem to fit more with them than any other party. Yeah, I mean, I haven't really delved into the Libertarian Party to, to know where they stand. I'm not sure they'd want to bring somebody in that isn't quite a match with their views. But, um, you know, it's too late for, for this election. I mean, just to try to wing it, just to try to shake things up, that, you know, the law of unintended consequences tends to create a lot more problems than it solves. You know, you're a big advocate of Michael Bloomberg running. Uh, you advocated him running, I think, in 08, in 12, and again in 16. He chose not to because he said he didn't think he could win. Is that a good enough reason? <laughs> well, yeah, if you're the person having to do all the work and grind through it, of course it is. But is that you good know, for the country? Well, again, if, you're, if, you're hard, if you don't think you can win, then your decision making is impacted by that. It's the same in sports. It's the same in politics. It's the same in business. If you don't think you're going to succeed, I think voters in this case would, would see right through it and see that that's the case. So you can't, you can't go into it not willing to do the work, not willing to grind. And so, you know, and it's his choice to make. Assess the Obama presidency. I think he's done a lot of good things, contrary to what some think. I think he's made a lot of mistakes as well, and, and that's what you expect from a president. I think he's smart. I think he, um, his, his goal was to really bring up people from the bottom and providing health care. That's been a positive step. I think he's really had the interest of the country at heart, but I think he's made some significant mistakes in foreign policy. What's uh, Obamacare meant to your business? It really hasn't impacted my businesses at all because we tend to, uh, to have invested in health care for our employees. But I think from an entrepreneur's perspective, it's given entrepreneurs the chance to leave jobs they were stuck in and get insurance where they otherwise, otherwise might not have had it. And it really, to me, where, what it's accomplished, I have a saying that, that I live by in a lot of my thinking. It's called the risk doesn't leave the system. And what happens is, you know, we might not have provided health care for as many people in the past directly, but we provided it indirectly. And when you have to provide a cost indirectly, it's always more expensive. And so while we're having to pay more for mm -hmm. um, our insurance costs, we're paying more for our medical costs, at least we're doing it up front. Or at least we're trying to do it systematically. Because if we do it and people are outside the system, it's not like all of a sudden they're healthy. Right. It's not like all of a sudden they don't have medical needs. And so we have to pay for them for our property taxes, through other taxes, and that's far less efficient. And that's why I've been a proponent, proponent of Obamacare. All right, let's go. You just said uh, you were uh, not happy with him on foreign policy. Give me a specific. I, you know what? I'm not the guy who's a foreign policy whiz kid to get into details. I mean, you know, I think. But you're not happy. I mean, you, you well, sound no, like. There, no, you, you, yeah. there's a difference between not being happy and not thinking it was it was a perfect implementation. You know, whether it's drawn the, the bright line, whether, you know, how we approach dealing with Syria, whether it's, you know, whether or not we should have kept people in um, Iraq longer. Um, you know, he's really tried to, to have an open mind and dealing with some, open mind's not the right um, description. 
I, I think he's he's recognized that there's a lot of difficulties in foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, particularly mm -hmm. as it applies to terrorism. And there's no right answer. And I think he was searching to find solutions. And because of that uncertainty, because of that search, mm -hmm. some things happened that we didn't expect. And that's created a lot of difficulties. I may have done it differently, but I'm not qualified to dig in and give you a, uh, a, you know, a specific now. One more thing I want to get in on your on your sort of potential political philosophy of sorts. You had a, uh, a pretty interesting take on how to deal with student debt, and you thought the yeah. government was actually helping to raise the cost Without of tuition, question. not lower it. Explain. Okay, a couple things. One, there, there's, when there's easy money, if you look back at the real estate crisis and the, the Great Recession of 2007 um, and 2008, mm -hmm. what caused it was easy money. Anybody could borrow money and go buy a house, which raised the, the price of, the, of housing. And it got to the point where there was a bubble, and then the bubble burst when the easy money burst. The same thing is happening with college tuition right now. Anybody can borrow money. There's a limit in what can be federally guaranteed for the student, but there's no limit on how much a parent can co-sign for, how much a parent can borrow for their student, for their, uh, their kids, um, in order to pay for tuition and other costs. And as a result of that, it's been easy money for colleges, which mm -hmm. has meant they've been able to continue to raise tuitions. And the money they brought in, it's not like they're spending it on core things that improve a kid's education. Instead, they're, they're trying to improve the drive-up appeal because there's so much competition right. for students. So they're spending it on stadiums, they're spending it on gyms, they're spending it on you know, restaurants, they're spending it on you know, curbside appeal, which doesn't really impact their education. Mm -hmm. So my solution has been put a limit on the amount of money that a family can borrow per student. If you limit that right. to, say, $30,000 in total, then the easy money is gone for colleges and tuition will drop like a rock. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. All right. You've said you would tax the hell out of Wall Street. Explain what that means. Well, when I said that right now, there's, um, there's an issue right now for me with market structure. I think we're in significant risk with high frequency trading because what's happening in, you know, the original goal of Wall Street was to be able to create a source of capital for companies to grow, create liquidity and allow investors to invest. But what we've evolved to now with things like high frequency and algorithmic trading, but in particular high frequency trading, is that we're, it's all about financial engineering. It's not about investing in companies and watching them grow anymore. And so we're seeing quotes, transactions that happen in milliseconds. That has nothing to do with investing. And so if you put just a minuscule tax on each trade, possibly even a smaller um, tax on each quote, you're going to see Wall Street, you're going to see markets gear back towards actual investments. You sound like now, Bernie Sanders, by the way. He's got a s proposal to pay for his free college that essentially does what you're saying, tax on transactions. Yeah, it, it won't work because you're going to see that won't happen because, A, you're going to see the number of transactions decline, and so mm -hmm. the amount of revenue he thinks he's going to get is not going to match his expectation. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. And on the flip side, his idea for paying for free college tuition is delusional because it's even more easy money for the colleges, which means they're going to raise tuition even more, and it's going to cost taxpayers even more. All right, let me, let me go back to Clinton uh, versus Trump here. You joke that you would love to be Clinton's running mate as long as you were allowed uh, to throw bombs at Trump. Are you... If she really did come to you, would you listen? Absolutely. Um, but the key would be that she'd have to go more to center. I think, you know, I like the fact that um, Senator Clinton has thought out proposals. That's a good thing because at least we get to see exactly where she stands. But I think Senator Sanders has dragged her a little bit too far to the left. Mm -hmm. Things like college tuition and you know, other um, business elements that really, I think, could hurt the economy. If she's willing to listen, if she's willing to, you know, hear other, other sides of things, then I'm wide open to discussing it. What about Donald Trump? Same. You know, I'm, I'm an independent, and I'm, I'm fiercely independent and think for myself, and I'd have the same conversation for Donald. I think Donald has a real chance to win, and that's scary to a lot of people, but what's scary about it to me is that you can see him now trying to do what he thinks is right to unify the party, and he's listening to everybody, which is fine on the surface, but what's also happening is it's coming across as if he's proposing things based off the last person he talks to. Oh, you need to you know, re unite the conservatives, and here are 11 people to propose right. for Supreme Court justices. I bet you if you asked him about any one of them and then to discuss any one of their 
um, findings, he wouldn't be able to do it. And to me, that's a problem. And so if he asked me, I'd be like, okay, Donald, that's great. Let's talk about it. But we're both going to have to dig in and really look and understand the issues so we can so we can come up with solutions. You know, if you and I had talked 10 years ago. One of the questions I might have asked would have been about your temperament. Right. There was, you know, when people have seen Mark Cuban 10 years ago, it was the guy yelling at officials, you know, the owner of the Mavericks getting mad and all this stuff. You've 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 toned it down. No, absolutely not. No, but, you, but you have. And, and Donald Trump, some people will say, has never changed his temperament. Well, first of all, there's two sides. Right. When I'm during a Mavericks game. That's where I let it loose. That's where I let out all my anxiety, all my aggression. And I'll still scream, right? But the other 23 hours a day or 22 hours a day, this, what you see now, has always been my temperament. And with Donald, could he change? You know, and it's possible for anybody to change, but, you know, I just don't see evidence that he wants to change. I think, he, I think he's trying to do what he, think is the right, he thinks is the right thing right now, but there's just so much coming at him at once. He's looking for shortcuts, and this is just not a job where there's shortcuts. What um, what would you uh, what would it take to convince you to run in a 2020 or a 2024? It's too early to tell. I mean, depending on what happened with you know whoever is elected, depending on what happens with the economy, because the reality is there's so much uncertainty with the economy, and neither candidate really has come up with anything even relevant to the economy, you know, and so we'd have to see what happened. We'd have to see, you know, if Congress still does nothing or they've managed to take steps and really have an impact. There, there's so many variables that I don't have the answers to. I really couldn't tell you. You know, and one final issue question. You're a business guy, so I'm guessing you're probably a, uh, would call yourself a free trader. Yes. The rest of the, as you can see, both parties are revolting against the idea of trade agreements. Crazy. They blame them. They essentially blame them. And, these, and I've, I've been all throughout, particularly the middle of the country geographically. What do you say to those folks that A couple uh, things. Uh, believe that these trade agreements have been bad for the economy? Let's start lining up the people who are in businesses that export products. You know, I think in the, the state of Texas, there's hundreds of billions of dollars in exports shipped every year. We live in a global economy. The minute you start messing with the dynamics and the relationships between the economies, whether it's currency, whether it's trade agreements, mm -hmm. whether it's just the, the tenor of conversations between China, UK, whoever it may be, it's a very delicate balance that, we, that really has a lot of uncertainty associated with it. You've got to be very careful. And what I would do is I'd start lining up people who are in businesses that export. Because not only are we not going to all of a sudden create jobs because we've put tariffs on, but on the flip side, you're going to start losing jobs. You're going to start losing exports. You're going to start impacting the currency. You're going to start impacting what the Federal Reserve is able to do. You're going to start impacting jobs in ways that have, we're not certain about. And so I would be very, very careful. You know, maybe okay. we can negotiate contracts better, um, deals better. But the reality is, in a global economy, right. there's a very delicate balance, and you just can't willy-nilly make propositions and, and expect you know, that everything's just going to get better. All right. Out question is this. Cavs, Warriors, or Thunder? I, I've already eliminated the Raptors. <laughs> you know, I'm going I'm to take a little bit of a lob sh long shot here and go with the Thunder. Oh, well, that's bad news for Washington fans because everybody worries that he'll never come to Washington if he wins a title in OKC. All right. Mark Cuban, thanks for coming on. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate it. You got it. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and then click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.